Hey everyone, Noah Zerby here. This is one of a series of short videos looking at instruments of foreign policy. That is, when a government wants to achieve a foreign policy goal, what tools are available to it to achieve that goal? In this video, we're going to look at the use of force, or the military, as a tool of foreign policy. Other videos will deal with espionage, diplomacy, and economic tools of foreign policy. But if you're ready, let's get started. You should recall from our other video that the various instruments of foreign policy can be placed upon a spectrum of coercion or of violence. Broadly speaking, the military tools of foreign policy are going to fall towards the more coercive end of the spectrum, though even here we'll see a range of activities possible. As a tool of foreign policy, the use of force or the threat of the use of force can take a number of different forms. The deployment of military forces is often used as a symbolic commitment or as an expression of priorities without any real intention of using force, at least in the short term. There are countless examples of this. Uh, Russia regularly flies air patrols to encroach on U.S. airspace without actually entering it, forcing the U.S. to respond with patrols of its own. Uh, Canada regularly holds sovereignty exercises in its Arctic region, re-emphasizing its legal claim to and control over its northern reaches. Uh, the United States regularly sends its navy on freedom of navigation operations into the South China Sea, reinforcing its claim that the region is subject to international protections and is not the sovereign ter territory of China or of other current countries making such claims. The U.S. regularly conducts these sorts of freedom of navigation operations in a host of contested waterways. Other times, countries will maintain a more symbolic troop deployment in other countries to express their support for those governments and to caution opponents about the cost of attacking. A well-known example of this might include U.S. troop deployments to Germany and elsewhere during the Cold War. Such deployments would not likely have been able to stand up to a full Soviet attack into Western Europe. Rather, they were intended to reassure American allies that we were committed to their defense and to warn the Soviet Union that it attack and against Germany would provoke a direct military confrontation with the United States. The U.S. maintains a similar presence in South Korea today with a similar goal of deterring North Korean aggression. States may also enter into formal alliances or mutual defense agreements as part of their broader foreign policy. During the Cold War, for example, the United States founded the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, in order to provide for the common defense against the threat of the Soviet Union, and in response, the Soviet Union formed the Warsaw Pact, or more formally, the Treaty of Friendship, Cooperation, and Mutual Assistance. While these are the most well-known defense pacts, many others exist. In addition to NATO, the United States has a mutual defense pacts with the Philippines, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea. Korea. The Treaty of Lisbon established mutual defense among the members of the European Union, and Russia has collective security agreements with Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and so on. Normally, such treaties provide that the member states will come to each other's defense if one of the other one or the others is attacked. Treaty members will sometimes engage in joint training exercises, largely as a symbolic expression of their mutual commitment. The United States and South Korea, for example, hold annual combined field training exercises called Operation Full Eagle every year. It's regularly the largest combined training operation of the year, involving dozens of ships, hundreds of aircraft and thousands of soldiers in training operations that span amphibious assaults, combat air operations, ground maneuvers, maritime action, and special forces exercises, much to the chagrin of North Korea, which regularly condemns the exercises as an unnecessary provocation. Countries may also use the threat of a military response to achieve foreign policy goals. During the Cold War, such strategies were often called brinksmanship and were a common feature of U.S.-Soviet engagement as each sought to push the other to the line of direct confrontation in hopes that it would back down. Perhaps the best example of this took place during the Cuban Missile Crisis, which we consider elsewhere in the course. Deterrence is a specific kind of this type of threat. Deterrence is a specific type of this kind of threat. In the simplest terms, deterrence refers to efforts to dissuade an adversary from taking aggressive action by persuading them that the cost incurred by taking the action would outweigh any potential gains. Deterrence theory is most commonly associated with nuclear 
politics in the Cold War, where both the United States and the Soviet Union maintained massive nuclear stockpiles that would be capable of entirely destroying the other, thus creating strong incentives to never use them and to prevent any crisis from escalating to the point where nuclear weapons may be used. But the concept of deterrence is more widely applicable, and states may use the threat of force to raise the cost of another state taking action against them. Military force may also be used to enforce economic sanctions, usually through a naval blockade or enforcement of a no-fly zone. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, the United States used its naval forces to blockade Cuba and prevent Soviet cargo ships from landing on the island. Similarly, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union imposed imposed a blockade around West Berlin, forcing the United States and its allies to provision the city with food, fuel, and supplies by air for more than a year. At the height of the crisis, one plane was landing in West Berlin every 30 seconds. The Berlin airlift became one of the defining crises of the Cold War era and a strong symbol of American resolve and commitment to preventing the Soviet Union from expanding its control into Western Europe. But we can also look to more recent examples, such as the U.S. enforcement of a no-fly zone over southern Iraq in 1991, or the U.N.-imposed no-fly zone over Libya after its revolution. Technically, blockades can be considered an act of war under international law, and so countries will often use creative terms to describe very similar actions. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example, the United States refused to call its actions a blockade and instead had, had imposed, stated it had imposed a quarantine on Cuba. Moving up the scale of violence, targeted strikes involve the direct application of military force to achieve a foreign policy goal. Advances in military technology, particularly improved targeting and guidance for missiles, have created the opportunity for states to engage in violence short of full-scale war. By far the most common example of this today are the drone strikes launched from combat drones like the MQ-1 Predator and the MQ-9 Reaper, both of which can be deployed globally while being piloted from stations inside the United States. Military drones carry advanced avionics and sensors, are capable of remaining on station for hours, and can carry extensive munitions, including laser-guided bombs and Hellfire missiles. The United States has launched hundreds of drone strikes in an effort to take out high-value targets as part of the global war on terror. Indeed, the U.S. maintains a classified disposition matrix, or more commonly referred to as a kill list, of individuals targeted for killing. The process itself has been criticized on a couple of grounds. First, suspects included on the kill list, which legally may include U.S. citizens, are never formally charged with any crime, provided any legal due process, or offered a trial in their defense. In this sense, targeted strikes are much more like acts of war and treatment of enemy soldiers than domestic crimes prosecuted by the state. Because of this, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights has argued that targeted strikes constitute extrajudicial killings and are a violation of international law. Secondly, critics of U.S. drone strike programs argue that such strikes are much less accurate than typically presented, with collateral damage and civilian bystander deaths much greater than actually reported. Military forces may also be used to maintain peace or to assist in rebuilding in post-conflict situations. We most commonly associate this with United Nations peacekeeping operations around the world. There are currently 13 UN peacekeeping operations active around the world involving more than 80,000 military, police, and civilian personnel from over 100 countries. But countries will sometimes use their military forces independently of UN peacekeeping operations in attempt to ensure greater stability or to support various initiatives. Examples might include U.S. intervention in Somalia in the early 1990s, when U.S. military forces were used to protect the delivery of humanitarian aid and remove and replace various warlords controlling the city under Operation Gothic Serpent. While that mission ultimately failed in the events described in Black Hawk Down, the U.S. military maintains a stability and support operations group with missions that include providing assistance and security after natural disasters or social and political upheavals and even insurgencies. The U.S. military describes stabilization missions as efforts by which the military and non-military actors collectively apply the various instruments of national power to address drivers of conflict, foster host nation resilience, and create conditions that enable peace and security.
States may also engage in a variety of forms of unconditional warfare, a broad category that often includes all military operations short of total war, generally with the goal of overthrowing or disrupting power of an existing government or occupying power. In the U.S. military, the contemporary idea of unconventional warfare emerged from the U.S. experience in Vietnam, described by President Kennedy in the following terms. There is another type of warfare, new in its intensity, ancient in its origin. War by guerrillas, subversives, insurgents, assassins. War by ambush instead of combat. By infiltration instead of aggression. Seeking victory by eroding and exhausting the enemy instead of engaging him. It preys on unrest. Special forces operations are the clearest example of this sort of operations, particularly when they are used behind enemy lines with the mission of training, equipping, and advising local forces, and aiding local resistance fighters. This sort of operation was particularly common during the Cold War, as the United States and the Soviet Union each organized and supported rebel forces to oppose and destabilize governments allied with the other. Finally, states may also engage in conventional warfare in pursuit of foreign policy objectives. Usually, war is viewed as a last resort, as the costs associated with this level of military engagement can be incredibly high, both in economic terms and in the cost of human lives. The high cost of using force creates some real limits on its applicability in foreign policy. First, military force is a blunt instrument that cannot be readily applied to all circumstances. There's an adage that you always need the right tool for the job. A hammer is good for driving a nail, but not good for cutting a wire. Similarly, military force may be effective in some roles, but it's not well suited for others. Nevertheless, political leaders who want to appear strong and to be seen taking decisive action will sometimes call on the military to operate in ways ill-suited for its mission. This has sometimes led to tensions between civilian and military leadership, most clearly reflected in the Powell Doctrine, which we'll address elsewhere. Second, using military force comes with real costs. Certainly the military itself is expensive, but even more importantly from the perspective of political leadership, the deployment of forces abroad may carry political costs. Early in military deployments, there's often a rally around the flag effect where popular support for the mission expands, and by extension, the political leaders who order it feel empowered. We see sharp spikes in the approval ratings of both President George W. Bush when the war in Afghanistan started, and similarly for his father when the first Iraq war started in the early 1990s. But both leaders soon became increasingly unpopular as the war dragged on with no clear path for victory or exit. Third, political leaders will sometimes use the military in an effort to bluff. That is, they may hope that the threat of a military response dissuades their opponents from taking a particular action. But what happens when your opponents call your bluff? On August 12, 2012, President Obama issued a clear statement stating that the use of any chemical weapons by the Syrian government would cross a red line for the United States. In international diplomacy, the phrase red line is a particularly important one, signaling a point of no return, a line which, once crossed, would provoke a sharp response, likely a military response, by the offended country. But in this situation, the Assad regime in Syria was willing to push the envelope. Assad's forces used a variety of chemical weapons, including sarin gas, chlorine gas, and sulfur mustard gas, in numerous attacks against rebel forces, killing more than a thousand people in total. Despite declaring a red line and implying that a U.S. military response to the use of chemical weapons would be imminent, the United States took no action against Syrian forces after the attack, signaling to the Syrian government that the red line declaration was a bluff and clearing the way for further attacks. Republicans resoundingly criticized Obama, arguing that the U.S. failure to respond would weaken the threat of action against opponents in the future. Bluffs may work well, until they are called or you develop a reputation for bluffing, after which they're not nearly as effective. So that concludes our overview of the use of force as a tool of foreign policy. Be sure to check out the other videos in this series, and thanks for watching. Have a good day. Bye.